Hi, my name is Tammy Pazaricki. I own Pleasant Trees Adult Day and Consulting Services in Marlboro. I'm a certified Alzheimer's disease and dementia care trainer, a certified first response, responder dementia trainer, and a certified dementia practitioner. My passion is to teach others about Alzheimer's and other dementia so that we can put forth the efforts of a dementia-friendly community to remove the stigma of this disease and get people out of isolation and more engaged in their community. So first I want to introduce you to Dr. Aloise Alzheimer's. Um, he was the psychiatrist who named this disease way back early 1907. Um, they found plaques and tangles and here we are 2017 and do not have a cure nor a treatment to stop this disease. I'm going to provide you with some statistics that are staggering. Um, it is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. One in three seniors dies with some form of dementia. Uh, over 5.4 million Americans are living with disease, this disease. The problem is it's ever growing. So we're expecting the numbers to just triple. Um, the problem is we have a baby boomer generation that has exploded. Um, we're seeing all kinds of different dementia. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today as well. Alzheimer's is non-discriminating. It affects all cultures, all races, every country, every human is affected by this disease. And if you don't know someone with this disease, it's pretty sure, I'm pretty sure you will get to know someone with this disease. The risk factors, well, the greatest risk factor of developing Alzheimer's is age. So the older we get, the only way we can focus on preventing the disease is actually through a healthy lifestyle, choosing a good diet, um, drinking in moderation, no smoking, doing exercising, things of that nature to uh, boost our system to prevent the disease. Other cultures like Hispanics and African Americans are actually at greater risk due to their predisposition of other health issues such as high cholesterol, heart disease, diabetes, um, but the chances double by fi every five years after the age of 65. If you reach 85, your chances um, are 50-50. And 95, if you reach 95 and have no form of dementia, well, then you probably won't develop it. Um, there are plenty of genes that are associated with developing this disease. And if you do have a um, relative with the disease, then yes, your chances do go up. Um, and basically knowing what the risks are, um, you can better and educate yourself, you know, educate yourself on the signs and the symptoms. And we're going to go through that. What does it mean to have dementia? What does it mean to have Alzheimer's? And I want to make this clear that when you talk about Alzheimer's, that's how you pronounce it. Alzheimer's, not old timers, not all timers. It's Alzheimer's disease. So what is normal aging? Alzheimer's is not a part of normal aging. Neither is any dementia disease process. So we may forget parts of experiences. We may misplace things like forgetting our keys somewhere. Um, we, it may take more di less distraction in order to learn new material. Our cognitive mapping stays intact and our cognitive mapping is how we wayfind, how we get from point A to point B, or how we can retrace our steps to find those keys that we misplaced. Now dementia is not a diagnosis. Dementia is a set of symptoms. Symptoms that are related to um, memory loss, poor judgment, confusion to time and place, um, cognitive mapping decline. So we start to lose our way, start 
on a path to go somewhere and forget where we were going. On I, on the inability to identify certain objects, um, word finding difficulties, challenges with um, planning our day. And for someone that has normal aging, well, yeah, they can use a calendar, a notepad. Um, and early in the disease process, you may find that someone's starting to keep notes, um, using sticky tabs all over the place to remind themselves. But eventually, that doesn't help them out. There are reversible causes of dementia. This is important to know because if there are symptoms and signs of this disease, we need to figure out what disease is causing the signs of dementia. So things like infection, urinary tract infection, pneumonia, any metabolic and endocrine issues, vitamin deficiency, nutritional deficits, medication side effects, is it just that you have hearing loss or visual loss due to some other disorder? The reversible causes for dementia can be treated. It could be a brain tumor. That's why it's so important to get a true diagnosis. When a physician sends their patient home and says they have dementia, that is not acceptable. There needs to be a complete workup to know what's going on to cause those dementia symptoms. Now, non-reversible dementia disease processes, these are fatal neurological diseases that um, are not curable. They do not have treatments. In fact, the only proven treatment for Dementia is socialization, using your mind, keeping engaged with other people. Um, this is a shortened video on purpose because we're trying to give folks a glimpse of what Alzheimer's and dementia is all about and understand it. Um, so I'm not going to get into every single re uh, non-reversible disease process because that would be a long training. So to learn and understand that Alzheimer's is the most prevalent of all the diseases that cause dementia, that's why we focus on it. But there are others, Lewy body, Parkinson's, frontotemporal lobe, Huntington's, and the list goes on. But it's most important that we know with the Alzheimer's Association, which is the best support and educational institute out there, um, offered to families and caregivers at no cost. Their focus is to help those suffering with dementia and the caregivers. And really, they deal with all the disease processes. So we're going to talk a little bit more about Alzheimer's because, again, it is the most common. There are three ways, I guess you'd say, someone can get Alzheimer's. Um, there's the late onset, where we see someone developing in, in their 80s, maybe, um, starting with those dementia symptoms. We talk about a s stages, preclinical stage, mild cognitive impairment, early, middle, and late. And I can, I'm, I'm not able to get into every symptom in each of the stages, but just understand this, it is progressive. So with the older onset, um, we're talking 80s. Then there's the young onset, or what we now call early onset Alzheimer's, which literally can affect folks very young. I personally have worked with um, folks in their 40s and 50s and 60s. There's a familial gene that causes a familial Alzheimer's that absolutely wipes out 50% of the family. And I worked with an individual who um, was 28 years old who had just been diagnosed with the familial onset. And unfortunately, she had four children. So um, this, the Alzheimer's really is an epidemic. And my hope is to just inform you of, um, to be aware of it. So this is a picture of the brain and what happens to the brain with the Alzheimer's disease process. And basically, it loses three quarters of its weight. It, it's, being, it's dying off because there are plaques building in the brain, killing off nerve cells, 
and unfortunately that's um, not repairable. So this is unfortunately what it does. It gradually takes the person's ability to control anything about themselves and it takes that away. The good news, if there could be any good news in this disease, is that there are still a lot of qualities of that person still very much alive. And that person can have a very good quality of life. If we understand how to reach that person, when they become in, unable to talk to us, to, to communicate verbally, um, they can feel what remains is their emotions. So they feel every feeling that we feel, um, they can express any emotion that we feel. They become the best at um, detecting our body language, actually. Um, and they almost can mirror the body language behind their, with whatever emotion they're trying to express. So that's why it's important to learn strategies and approaches and how to communicate with someone with dementia, um, knowing that you know someone in the very early stages, they may be able to communicate really well. Um, there are some out there that believe new memories can still be made. I believe that if you are able to connect with the person emotionally, and create a good feeling in that person, then that's where that memory is stored. The good feelings. The fact that you've created a good moment for them is what they can remember. They'll remember those feelings. They may not remember what they ate, who they met, a person's name, um, but they're gonna remember how you made them feel. One phenomenon that you should be aware of, it's called sundowning. Sundowning is, occurs in dementia. Um, it doesn't happen for everyone, but it's a very common thing that happens towards the end of the day. The biggest thing is that we lose light. The sun goes down, things get gray, get dark. The person with dementia can get more confused. They can get more disoriented. We can see behaviors, and behaviors I call unwanted communication, because I don't like the word behaviors. They're only trying to express their feelings, um, and sometimes they're words they can't use. So it becomes a challenging time for a caregiver during sundowning. And I really relate this to chronic fatigue of the person with dementia. They've had a very long day, they've expelled a lot of energy, and they're tired. Um, we pair it with shadowing. They become stuck like glue to their, to their care partner because they're depending on that person to know what the next steps of their day are going to be. Another thing you need to know about is wandering. Wandering occurs, statistics say six out of ten folks with Alzheimer's will wander. I think the statistics are much higher. Um, they have a reason. Why do they leave the safety of their home? Well, they may need to go pick up the kids from school. They may need to catch a bus. They may need to go to work. All is driven by a goal. They have to get somewhere. But the problem being that cognitive mapping has stopped and they get to a point where they don't remember where they were going, why they were going, or how to get back. And in the community, we're trying to educate people on recognizing the signs of someone wandering. And no longer are we just looking for an older adult, you know, in their 80s and 90s. We could be looking at someone in their 50s suffering from the disease, but who is lost in our community. Um, they will not ask for help. Uh, some, of the tr some of the things that you could look for is they're dressed inappropriately for the weather or they're, aim they're walking around in a parking lot looking for their car and can't remember where they parked. I've certainly done that, but I'm able to retrace my steps to find it. Those that look um, very distressed, very upset, you know that they're at a point where they can't complete the task that they're trying to, to complete. These are the dominant feelings of a person with Alzheimer's all day long. 
they feel all these negative feelings 24 7 and the only things that can take them out of those feelings and provide positive feelings for them are the people around them so if it's their caregivers their family members if they go to out in their community and are received well by the wait staff at a restaurant things as simple as that um, we're going to instill good feelings, making them more confident about being with people. Because this is a very um, isolating, withdrawing, and, and secluding disease. I mean, it, it basically, these folks feel um, that they're not useful anymore, they're not needed in their community anymore, and that they don't have a purpose. And we all get up every morning with a purpose and a reason to get up. And unfortunately, the person with Alzheimer's disease can't find that purpose. So it is our job as caregivers to try and find what purpose we can instill in them. Communication changes happen with someone with Alzheimer's or other dementia. Some diseases cause the person to lose word finding ability very early in the disease. Some they struggle with names later in the disease. But in any case, communication changes happen. If it's more of a frontotemporal lobe dementia, then you're going to find that this person is much more impulsive. Their social graces are uh, going so that, that they may do or say something in public that may be an embarrassment to the caregiver. Um, these are not the person. This is not what makes up the person. These are the symptoms of the disease process. Challenges with formulating and communicating what their thoughts are. That must be such a struggle to know in some sense what you want to say, but that you can't say it. Um, the other thing to consider is that sensory impairments. When someone has a visual deficit or a hearing impairment, I've trained audiologists where the caregiver brings the person into the doctor's office and says, well, my mother has dementia. And in reality, the person just struggled with hearing loss. Once they fixed the hearing loss, the person did not have dementia. So all these things need to be looked at when someone suspects that someone's displaying these symptoms. These are the strategies and interventions, and I'm going to go through these quickly um, because there's a few slides, but all of it is important. So. Number one, first and foremost, smile. We all smile in the same language and it is your way of unlocking the door to communicate with someone who has Alzheimer's. Stranger or no stranger, if we approach that person calmly from the front and we're smiling, it's very hard for us to not open the door and window for communication. Establishing eye contact and being at their level, which means if you're really tall and they're really short, you want to get and bend your knees down to where you can really speak to them face to face. Um, introducing yourself, greeting that person, speaking slowly. What we do in our own language is we really speak quickly. And unfortunately, it takes a person with dementia a lot longer to process what we're saying. So when they're asked a question, it might feel like this long moment of silence, when in reality, if you give that person time, they are processing the question and they may be able to answer it. What we do in our culture is just ask it again a different way or ask another question and you've just lost the first question and the potential answer. So slow it down, pronunciate your words, um, it's very difficult if you have caregivers who have very heavy accents. So it's wise to have them knowledgeable about how they speak to a person with Alzheimer's. We want to be an attentive listener to that person because it's going to take them time to get across how they're feeling. And we have two ears and one mouth for a reason so that we're good listeners and good detectives to the needs and wants of that person. Offer comfort, reassurance, empathy, and validation. And most of all, show patience and support. They do not respond well to being rushed. The caregivers have to offer plenty of time. The person at the cash register, when the person is um, buying their groceries and, and is struggling 
with trying to get out their wallet, put their card in the machine and pay for it. Now, if someone was trained and sensitive to the needs of that person, they would kindly, compassionately, and with patience, offer that person support to get them through the task that they need to. Um, we want to focus on their feelings, focus on body language, and also on our own body language. What are we saying to them? Arguing, criticizing, and saying no are probably the worst three things you can do to a person with dementia. So keep that in mind when you're communicating. If they're trying to ask something, offer a guess. It may not be the right guess, but you're offering a guess anyway, because you're showing interest in what they have to say. Never use restraint or force, ever. Go with them. You are going to join them in their reality, which is very hard to do, because they may think they're living up at the Cape House beach, and you're going to try and reorient them that no, they're in our house that we've lived in for 40 years and raised our kids. The problem with that is that it creates harsh feelings, mistrust, paranoia, and all those negative things we're trying not to do. So just going along with the fact that, yeah, sure, we're at the Cape Beach house. Nothing wrong with that. Fiblets. We talk about fiblets because they're the most useful tool when it comes to a person with dementia. Fiblets are, are therapeutic non-truths. They're not lies. They're, they're essentially a way in which you join them in their reality. You tell them a story that's believable and relieves them of their stress and anxiety of the situation. So creating a calm environment, if you're trying to communicate with someone with Alzheimer's and you've got the TV blaring, the vacuum going, pagers going off, all that is going to be a distraction. And your job is to connect with that person and being a trusted ally. Um, and that's how you communicate with someone with dementia. These are the benefits to good communication. You're enhancing their self-esteem. You're creating positive feelings, turning those negative ones off. You're diffusing power struggles, okay? And um, once they feel reassured and safe, because safety and security is something that they will lose eventually. And we all as humans need to feel that. We need to feel safe and secure. As I said before, all these are barriers to good communication raising your voice, getting angry, being impatient, um, all those things you want to take into consideration. And consequences of getting them into your reality, it's just not a way to do it, okay? So it has been my pleasure to bring to you a very brief overview of Alzheimer's and dementia. Thank you very much.